Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations. What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures, the innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation? What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby shares his love of books and libraries with scientist, philosopher, inventor, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, and our nation's third president, Thomas Jefferson. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on his tombstone, it says only three things. It says he was the author of the Declaration of Independence, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, and the father of the University of Virginia. But he was also the governor of Virginia, secretary of state, vice president, and president of the United States. And he created six or seven, depending on how you count them, great libraries. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson. Thank you. Take now, Mr. Jefferson, a warm welcome to you, sir. We're here in a bank building that's been converted to a library, and you're talking to a banker who's been converted into a librarian. <laughs> a, a bank now a library. A yes. Banker now a librarian. Yes, sir. That suggests to me that you have moved from the Federalist camp to the Republican camp, <laughs> and it is a most noble and worthy transition, I, sir. I am a Republican, sir, but that may not be what you mean. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, Mr. Jefferson, it, you did say in, in one of the, the first letters after coming out of the White House and into retirement at Monticello uh, that you thought it would do more extensive good at small expense to have a small circulating library in every county. In every county, yes. Yes. With a few well-chosen books uh, to be lent to the people of the country under such regulations as would secure their safe return. And, and An I always idea. recommended types of books, so history first. Geography, uh, natural philosophy, uh, some, some language, some fine arts. I wonder where this comes from, this love for books. I understand that your father left you some, some books. He, he died when you were only 14. He had a library of some 40 books, and I, I inherited those. My tutor, the Reverend James Morey, he was my second tutor. He was a correct classical scholar, and he awakened in me a love of books. He taught me Latin and Greek. I learned to read those in the original texts. And that's where that love of reading began. And I began building my first library as a young man. And, and it's said that you, at Shadwell, your family plantation, that you'd built, uh, by the time you were 27 years old, a library of 600 books, a very extensive yes. uh, book collection. Yep. You learned the classics as a young man. I understand in your commonplace book, the first entries were Horace and Ovid and the Georgics. But surely there, there were some adventure stories, the things that young, young boys like to read on their own. Yes, I, I read Gulliver's Travels. I was taken with uh, his encounters with the Lilliputians, and later in life when I would meet foes oftentimes of a Federalist persuasion, I would refer to them as Lilliputians. Yes, uh, I, I understand at various moments you referred to the Virginia legislature as the Lilliputian <laughs> legislature. I, I read Don Quixote. I, I met a character through a book. His name was Fortunatus. Fortunatus. And For, Fortunatus had a cap. It, w it was not like my hat that I just placed on my head. Fortunatus had a cap that when he put on his head, it would make him invisible and it would take him anywhere in the world. He had an unlimited purse, too, so Fortunatus could go anywhere and see everything. My books, my libraries, they became my cap of Fortunatus because they allowed me to travel anywhere to see anything. I love that idea, the, the, the library is the magical cap that takes you 
uh, through the world and travels through time. And even through time, yes, because I could go back to some of our earliest classics and read those as the authors wrote them in their languages. You went to university, which was uh, an unusual thing to do. Not many of uh, your friends or fellow Virginians would have, would have gone to college, but you went to William and Mary. I was privileged to have an education there, and not only an education, but I met Professor Small, William Small. He further built on the foundation that the Reverend Morey had laid and my love of books and my love of reading. Uh, and I'm, I'm but 16 or 17. And it first gave me the idea of the, the expansion of science and our, our place in the wider scheme of the world. It was just a wonderful opening for me. It was the conversational circle, it was music, it was... Yes, uh, yes, we played music together. Uh, it was the, the four of us exploring all of the classics. And then you studied law uh, with With, but you mm -hmm. also read poetry. My study of the law gave me a view of the dark side of humanity, but I read poetry to bring light to the other side. Very good. I, I, Very learned, good. I learned something of rhetoric by eavesdropping at the House of Burgesses and was privileged to hear Patrick Henry give his give me liberty or give me death speech. He spoke as Homer wrote torrents of eloquence, I described it. Now, Mr. Henry and I, later in life, we were not allies by any stretch of the imagination, but I was fascinated with his ability to speak. You read in, in, in many languages? You... I, I read many languages, many cultures. I wanted to know as much about as many different things from as, as many different sources as I, as I possibly could. I had a book translated from Chinese. I had a copy of the Koran. I didn't want to read just one particular vein of thought. I wanted the broad spectrum. The breadth of your, of your learning was extraordinary, and which you shared. You shared this breadth of learning with uh, John Adams, and when you, you were both in, in Europe together, traveling as, as tourists in, in England after your, your bad experience being presented to King George, who wasn't terribly happy about two revolutionaries at court. There, there was not a whole lot to commend England to us, but it was, uh, we were presented there with a chair that had been Shakespeare's, and Mr. Stratford, you went to Mr. Stratford Adams and, and I both birthplace. took the liberty of taking shavings from Shakespeare's chair that we might take those with us. It, a more classical memory of England than anything King George III had to offer to us. You're, you're the minister in, in Paris after the revolution, and it must have seemed like heaven, heaven to, uh, uh, I think you referred to yourself as a bibliomaniac, or in French, a bibliomanie. I haunted the bookstores of Paris. In my afternoons, when I wasn't otherwise occupied, I would go through the bookstores and I would handle practically every single book. I bought many, many books. And anything that could have a possible connection with or for our, our new republic, I bought those, I ordered them. I had standing orders from book buyers in Amsterdam and London and other cities of particular books and editions that I was looking for. But there I was ex had the opportunity to add a great number of books to my library. And you'd begun to get a reputation, obviously, with the Declaration and the summary view of, uh, uh, of the rights of British America as, as one of the, uh, uh, the great writers of your time. And the, the Declaration was an expression of your education? There was nothing new in that Declaration. It was drawn from natural law, from the rights of men, from the writings of Locke and Newton and Bacon. And it was to be, I call it, an expression of the American mind. It was not to be new and radical territory, but simply to express what it is that we are about. That was my governing principle. When you organized your, your library at Monticello, and ultimately it became the basis, uh, as we'll explain in a moment, uh, for the, the, library, the Library of Congress, you had a system that you drew from Bacon, from Francis Bacon. Memory, reason, and imagination, the human faculties, yes. Memory, reason, and imagination, or history, philosophy, philosophy fine and the arts. fine arts. Uh, those three faculties applied to those three categories. And it's, it's how I organized my library, how I organized my catalog within each of those, those three of history, philosophy, and fine arts. Divided and subdivided, there were 15 chapters in each. So my library had 45 chapters plus a 46 that I called polygraphical, volumes that spanned several of those disciplines. 
Monticello itself, uh, the, the library was, was a catalog of all your, your interests, but your interests were, were so wide. Architecture it, itself, Monticello was a represent, the, the first great neoclassical building in, in the United States. Architecture is my delight, and putting up and pulling down one of my chief amusements. Monticello was built and completed before I went to France, but it was there that I encountered the works of Palladio and his design and the dome, and I came back and tore half of Monticello down and greatly enlarged it and rebuilt it. It looked nothing like the original. You, you went to Nîmes in, in southern France and you stood in front of the, the Maison oh. Carré. Like a lovesick man staring at his mistress, I <laughs> sat for hours the finest, example of classic architecture in existence in the world. I wanted it to be the design for the Capitol in, in Richmond. I wanted that design to be replicated in America for this reason. But how is a taste in this beautiful art of architecture to be formed in our countrymen unless we avail ourselves of every occasion when public buildings are to be erected of presenting to them models for their study and instruction? as its object is to improve the taste of my countrymen, to increase their reputation, to reconcile to them the respect of the world, and to procure its praise. At Mon Monticello itself, uh, said by a later historian, was, was not only a great library, but was also a museum, a museum of natural history. You love natural history, uh, discovering the flora and fauna of the new world. There, there were bones at Monticello and animal skins and maps. It was a, a very small museum of, of natural history. You also were a great uh, in, inventor and you made things. The swivel chair is said yes. to be your, uh, your invention. You invented the revolving book stand so you could look at these, these, these books uh, together. So the editions that you would order from Europe of the Iliad, for instance, you would have more than one edition and read them simultaneously. I could compare them, or if I were working on a subject, I could have four or five books on the same topic and by a simple flip of the wrist could move from volume to volume. You came to an important moment uh, in, in your life, a moment that I, I think is, it epitomizes the importance of education in your life and, the, and the leg, your legacy in, in, in education. In, in 1779, in, in Virginia, the, the legislature decided to revise all the laws. In the middle of the revolution, and they appointed you and Mr. Wythe and Mr. Mason and a couple of others uh, to be the committee of revisers. Yes. And the most important bill a bill for the general diffusion of knowledge. It provided for free public education for all boys and girls in Virginia for a period of three years. It would divide every county into what I called hundreds, you might call them wards. Every school to be established within walking distance of the children in that county. And this is in a time when the only ones who received any kind of education were those who were born male and white and to parents of means. A well-educated citizenry was essential for the maintaining and the protection of our republic. I, I wrote that if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in the state of civilization, expects what never was and never will be. And we, we could not maintain our republic without an educated citizenry. And what did the legislature do? They did nothing, sir. Ah. <laughs> You also proposed at the same time a bill for amending the Constitution of the College of William and Mary. You wanted, you wanted to establish a much broader basis of the education at William and Mary. Elim eliminate the professors of theology that they had, more emphasis on the sciences, uh, more emphasis on natural history and natural philosophy, uh, less on religion. I wanted to take it out from the control of the Anglican Church and make it a publicly funded institution. Uh, it received the same fate that the elementary school bill did. And, and you also proposed, it was a, 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 a trio of laws, a bill for establishing a public library. Yeah. Not adopted. Not adopted, again, the little Lilliputians. Yes. Um, you become president of the United States. Or actually, let's, no, let's, let's start with the vice presidency. I think there's, a, there's an epitomizing moment in your, in your life. You are inaugurated as vice president of one organization, the United States of America, but the president of another organization. A great office and a small office, sir. And the small office was the second, the vice presidency. But the day before, I was inaugurated as the third president of the American Philosophical Society. Now what we call philosophy, you call science. So it was an organization of scientists, 
founded in the year of my birth by Dr. Benjamin Franklin. He served as president for many years. David Rittenhouse served after him. I became the third president of the society. I loved science. I loved men of so science. So you, you replaced Dr. Franklin not only not, sir, as, sir, as sir, president sir, of the American Philosophical sir, Society, sir, but as sir, ambassador sir, to France. Sir, sir. Yes, yes, Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Franklin was ambassador in France, and I took over you, that you replaced role. Him. No, sir. People would say, oh, you replaced Dr. Franklin, and I would say, no one can replace Dr. Franklin. I only succeed him. Ah. He, he must have his due, sir. Uh, so the, the freedom of the mind, the freedom of the press, the, 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 uh, the rights in the, in the Bill of Rights remain the focus of your life and your, your belief in the importance of education yes. to uh, yes. defend those rights. Yes. In fact, you said to Benjamin Rush in, 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 in a letter right before you became president that you'd sworn on the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Anyone who would presume to tell another man how he should or should not think. This view of the diffusion of knowledge leads you to, to, to a moment that is very important to those of us here uh, in, in Missouri. You took your secretary, Meriwether Lewis, to explore the West. Tell us about that and your instructions to them. Well, we, we bought this land known as Louisiana, roughly the western watershed of the Mississippi River, but had little knowledge of what it was that we had bought. So I arranged for Mr. Lewis to lead a company of men up the river, and I wrote lengthy instructions for Captain Lewis, but those instructions can be summarized really into, into four. First, they were to find the Northwest Passage, that water route through the western mountains where the, the headwaters of the Missouri River lay close to or interconnected with the waters of some western river that would allow men to travel by, by boat, by water, all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific. That was the primary reason for their going. So the other three goals, they were to report on the plants and animals of the western lands, not the ones that we knew in the east, things that were new, what grows there, what lives there that we have not seen before. Third, they were to learn about as much as they could about the Indian people, their dress, what they ate, their languages, to convince them that they were coming in peace. Fourth, to learn about the land itself. What, the eye of civilized man hadn't seen this territory. Was it flat? Was it rolling? Was it hilly? Was it fertile? Was it barren? Was it well watered? Was it dry? What? Those were the instructions that Meriwether Lewis went with. Yeah, but there was no Northwest Passage, was there? Everyone, myself included, knew that it existed. Everyone. But those rivers that we thought lay, would be interconnected were headwaters 300 miles apart and in between impenetrable mountains. It, much of the interest in what Lewis and Clark had done evaporated with the idea that there was no passage. During your presidency, besides sending Lewis and Clark out and buying Louisiana and, and uh, fighting with the British and, and, and the French, you're still buying books, lots and I lots I never stopped lots buying books, of books. Sir. never stopped. In, in, in fact, everywhere you went, you, you create the, these libraries. When the Continental Congress, the Articles of Confederation was in Annapolis, there's your Annapolis Library. When you were in Williamsburg, there's your Williamsburg Library. Everywhere you go, there is a library. And so when you retire from the presidency, if I'm correct, Mr. Mr. Jefferson, there were two and a half tons of books? There were a lot of books, sir. That, that you, you took back? Uh, if I bought books for other people, I had standing orders to buy such and such for Mr. Madison or Mr. Monroe or, or others. I tried to be generous with others in books as well. And, and you went back to, to Monticello to create this circle of friends with Madison and Monroe, who, mm -hmm. who, who both uh, built their plantation homes or Madison's plantation home, Monroe's smaller, right near yours yes. at, at, at Monticello, is it this vision of a circle of philosophers, philosopher statesmen. Uh, but then the, then the British decide to invade. And they chased you out of, when you were governor of Virginia, they chased you out of Charlottesville at one point. And now they chased uh, Jimmy Madison, your good friend, out, out of the White House. And in the Capitol, they used some of the books that you had begun to collect for the Library of Congress as kindling to burn the capital down. That may have been personal. Yes. <laughs> that may have been personal. And, and you made a noble gesture to the United States of America. It was then that I proposed to sell my library at Monticello 
to the nation to replace this one that had been destroyed to become the foundation of a new library for our nation. And your library at this point is probably the largest library in the colonies, one of the largest libraries in the world, almost 7,000 yes. books. But isn't it also true that you sold the, your library to the Library of Congress because of your debts to the British? I certainly was not in a position to give my library away but I wanted it to become the nation's library and because I didn't want anyone to say that I had profited unnecessarily off of, off of this, I offered to have someone come and appraise my library that they would establish its value and I would accept whatever that appraisal was. Well, it's clear from the numbers that you almost gave your library away to the United States. The Milligan, the uh, Georgetown bookseller who valued it, valued it based on on the size of the, the books. size of the books, the, the large the large books, the folios were ten dollars, the uh, quartos were six dollars, the octavos were three dollars, and the duodecimos were a dollar. So you sold it to the United States for about twenty four thousand dollars, and individual books were, were being auctioned in, in, in London for four hundred, five hundred, six yeah. six hundred dollars. So your seven thousand books were were surely worth fifty thousand, or maybe. $50,000 or maybe 50,000 pounds, which would have been eight times that. G given my financial distress at that time, sir, it does not help me now to learn that I might have sold them for far, far more. <laughs> you were living then in retirement at Monticello without Scarcely books? Scarcely had the last wagon load of books disappeared down the roundabout, going down from Monticello, that I cannot live without books and I began to buy books. So you, you pretty instantly filled those empty shelves. With. But this library was for pleasure, sir. This library was only for my own enjoyment. I was no longer concerned with that broader scope, so I bought books for my pleasure. As you're nearing the end of, uh, of your life, you're handed an opportunity by your nephew, Peter Carr, yes. who has been involved in the founding of, uh, of an academy. Uh, the Albemarle Academy. And you attempt to fund uh, Albemarle Academy uh, into the University of Virginia. Yes, the, the academy didn't exist. It's, it was simply the authority to create this grammar school in Albemarle County and expanded Albemarle Academy to become Central College and from there expanded that to become the University of Virginia and convincing the commissioners to locate that in Charlottesville just several miles away. I raised the political and financial support for the university. I designed the buildings. I surveyed the grounds. I developed the curricula. I recruited the professors from, from Europe. When the university opened its doors in 1824, I served as its, as its first rector. The, the last great effort of my life. You were asked many times at the end of your life to describe what you had learned or to give advice about, uh, about education. And Samuel Smith, one of your mm -hmm. colleagues, had asked you to write a letter to his son, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson Smith, and tell him uh, what you had learned and, and what would be good for him to learn. And you, you said to him, he should adore God, reverence your parents, love your neighbor as yourself, and your country more than yourself, be just and be true. But then you gave him uh, a kind of Benjamin Franklin decalogue, it's yes. called. Everything I had learned from these thousands of books I had read and, and decades serving, in the, serving the public, and I, I took all of that experience and wisdom and boiled it down to 10 points that I called a decalogue of canons for observation and practical life. And if I may, I'd like to read those yes, for please. the benefit of our group. Number one, never put off till tomorrow what you can do today. <laughs> Number two, never trouble another for what you can do yourself. I learned both of those from my father, Peter Jefferson, who was a surveyor by profession. Number three, never spend your money before you have it. <laughs> never buy what you do not want because it is cheap. It will be dear to you. Number five, pride, pride costs us more than hunger, thirst, and cold. Number six is particularly appropriate before a meal. We never repent of having eaten too little. You're here. <laughs> Number seven speaks of attitude. Nothing is troublesome that we do willingly. 
Number eight, how much pain have cost us the evils which have never happened? Number nine, drawn from the classics, take things always by their smooth handle. You have to think about that a little bit. It has several applications. Take things always by their smooth handle. And number 10, when angry, count 10 before you speak. When very angry, 100. <laughs> now, on your tombstone, uh, you, 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 you left an inscription about three things. Yes the Declaration of Independence, the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and the founding of the University of Virginia, of Virginia. Why those three things, and why not the presidency, and the vice presidency, and secretary of state, and? All of those other offices, all the other positions that I held, those were simply honors or opportunities that other people had bestowed upon me. These three things, the Declaration, the University of Virginia, the Statute in Virginia for Religious Freedom, which speaks to freedom of the body, freedom of the mind, freedom of the spirit, those were gifts that I felt I helped to give to the people of Virginia, to give to the people of America. Yeah, I wrote that epitaph, those three to adorn my tombstone and nothing else. This is an extraordinary thing that on July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, you and John Adams, your friend, died hours apart. Adams said, Jefferson still lives, were his last words. <laughs> you said, is it the fourth, were your last words. You were a builder of the library, builder of the nation with Adams, and the two of you were the Don Quixotes for liberty and for the learning that sustains it. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson's views are foundational for this republic, that all men are created equal, endowed by rights which cannot be taken away, that our government exists because we give it the right to exist. What I love most about being Mr. Jefferson is I can teach people about those foundational principles and how essential he was to the establishment of our nation and the rights that we enjoy yet today. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri and by these fine organizations.